Hello, and welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Emi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Today, Monday, the 29th of April, 2024, I'm grateful to God that we can bring to a conclusion our series on believing God for the extraordinary. Believing God for the extraordinary. Today's topic is God's extraordinary goodness when least expected. God's extraordinary goodness when least expected. Another way to describe today's topic is God's unmerited favor when we least expect it. God's unmerited favor when we least expect it. There are many examples of this in the Bible, but we will restrict ourselves to four passages as follows. First Samuel chapter 23, verses 19 to 29. Second Samuel, chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. Second Chronicles, chapter 33, verses 1 to 13. And the fourth passage, Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. All these four passages are stories about God's unmerited favor when least expected. They are stories about God's unmerited favor when least expected. As we all probably know, another name for God's unmerited favor is grace. Anytime we are talking about grace, Grace means God's unmerited favor. Because as you see, although God always rewards our faith, but even then and in all circumstances, it is the grace of God that works for us. Grace means free, spontaneous, absolute favor and loving kindness of God. The meaning of grace is free, spontaneous, absolute favor and loving kindness of God. Spontaneous, on the spur of the moment, right on time. So God's grace is about God's freedom to do whatever he pleases, anyway and at any time. So when we are talking about God's grace, it, it's about God's freedom to do whatever he pleases, anyway and at any time. When we are talking about God's favor or God's grace, God's grace is about God's spontaneity, God's wonderful ability to respond at the very moment to our need. God responding in a timely manner there and then to our need, the spontaneity of God. So it's about God's spontaneity. God is our ever-present help in the time of trouble. God is never late, even when it appears that God is slow or God has not come at the time that we are expecting it. But that is just part of the meaning of the unmerited favor of God, the meaning of grace. God's grace is about God's absolute favor. Even though God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, 
But no matter how you look at it, in the end, whatever God does is actually God's absolute favor. God does not owe us. We owe him. Even when we've done our best and we are rewarded by God, at the end of the day, when you look at it, God has done you a favor. God does not owe anyone. We owe him. God is not a debtor to anyone. That's the meaning of grace, you see. God's grace is about God's absolute favor. Finally, God's grace is about God's inexhaustible loving kindness. It's about the love of God that is bottomless. The kindness of God that you can never exhaust. That is God's grace as well. So you see, we can believe God for the extraordinary because God's extraordinary goodness often comes when least expected. No matter what we are going through, we can believe God for the extraordinary because God's extraordinary goodness often comes as a matter of his grace when least expected. I'm grateful to God that I can share this with you, that I have absolute confidence in the grace of God. I have absolute confidence in God's freedom to do whatever he pleases, anyway and at any time. I have absolute confidence in God's grace about God's spontaneity, God being our ever-present help in the time of trouble. God is never late. God is never late. Amen. I have absolute confidence in God's grace, God's absolute favor, and God's inexhaustible loving kindness. My whole experience in terms of my relationship with God, my whole experience is based on God's grace. My whole experience is based on God's grace. Every time we experience God's extraordinary goodness, when we least expect it, we are actually recipients of God's grace. Let me show us certain things that will stand out when God comes through for us, when we least expect it. Certain things that will stand out. I will follow the passages that I have earlier cited where we will find examples of people who received God's extraordinary goodness when they least expected it. Let's start with 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 19 to 29. In that passage, we can see that God is a God of suddenly. God is a God of suddenly. He never runs short of ideas to achieve his purpose. Let's read the story together in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 19 to 29. Then the Sephites came up to Saul, King Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds, in the woods, in the hill of Aquila? which is on the south of Jesimon. Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver David into the king's hand. So King Saul said, Blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure, and see the place where his hideout is and who has seen him there. For I am told David is very crafty. See therefore, and take knowledge of all the locking places where he hides, and come back to me with certainty, and I will go with you. 
and it shall be if he is in the land that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. So the Sephites arose and went back to Siv to search for David ahead of Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek David, David found out about this. Therefore, David ran away and went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that David had run into the wilderness of Maon, he pursued David. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David. They were encircling David and his men to capture them. Then a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called that place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in, struggle, in strongholds at Engedi. Can you see how God in his mercy allowed David to escape from Saul? Suddenly a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have invaded the land. God allowed Saul to leave his own city in Gibeah and start searching for David all over the place in the wilderness of Meon. God could have prevented Saul from doing that. But that was God's wisdom. He allowed the enemy to pursue David. But at the right time, God created an opportunity that gave David a very good reason to escape from Saul. What was the opportunity? The Philistines, they came invading Israel. So King Saul had to stop pursuing David. He now had to go and pursue the Philistines. That's how David received, at the time that he least expected it, he received the extraordinary goodness of God. God intervened on his behalf. God is a God of suddenly. God does not have a shortage of options to deal with any issue that we face. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit allow you to see this as an outstanding aspect of how God works when you least expect it. He acts suddenly and God has no shortage of options to make sure that his purpose for your life, his purpose for my life is achieved. Let's go to the second passage. The second example in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. In this passage, we see that God can use people that we least expect and at a time that we least expect to achieve his extraordinary goodness in our life. This is something that will stand out when you receive God's extraordinary goodness at a time when you least expect it. You will see that God can use people that you never thought about. God can use them at a time that you never expected. God can use them to achieve his extraordinary goodness in your life. I'm grateful to God that I can share this with you because it happens in my life too. But let's, let's go and read the passage together. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. 
This is about David's kindness to Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose name was Ziba. So when they had called Ziba to David, the king said to Ziba, Are you Ziba? And Ziba said, Yes, I am at your service, sir. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, Jonathan, who is lame in his feet. So the king said to Ziba, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodiba. Then King David sent and brought Mephibosheth out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodiba. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself because he wasn't expecting this royal invitation. He fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Are you Mephibosheth? And Mephibosheth answered, I am. Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? He wasn't expecting this royal favor at all. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant. And the king said to Ziba, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall walk the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. The servant of Mephibosheth himself had 15 sons and 20 servants. What a huge household. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons, like one of the princes as if I had given birth to him. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Mika, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. He, he did not return to Lodiba. A man who was living in Lodiba in poverty, in ignominy, a man who was living in Lodiba, lame, disabled, thinking that his life had finished, suddenly God favored him. The extraordinary goodness of God found him when he least expected. So Mephibosheth now dwelt in Jerusalem and he ate continually at the king's table. He never lacked again although he was lame in both his feet. His disability did not matter. When God decided to look his way, at the time when Mephibosheth was not expecting, God favored him. God blessed him extraordinarily. Clearly, as you can see, our schedules and plans may not materialize. I'm sure Mephibosheth, would have had many things that he would say. I would have loved to do, but I am lame. I would have loved to do this. I would have loved to achieve that, but I am lame in both feet. I am disabled. Why did God allow this? Why am I not favored? 
Listen very carefully. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit speak to you that you can receive God's extraordinary goodness at a, at a time when you least expect it. God's extraordinary goodness does not depend on your ability. It does not depend on your gender. It does not depend on your qualifications. It does not depend on the country where you are living in. It does not depend on your parental background. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit let you know that your own plans, your own goals may have suffered, may have crashed, may have not become materialized. You might be looking at your life thinking, I wish my life was different. But listen carefully. This very life that you have, that's the very life that God will bless, just as he blessed the life of Mephibosheth. Just as God took him away from poverty, from disgrace, to a place of riches, a place of honor. God is more than able to do that. Our schedules and plans and goals may not materialize, but God has other schedules and plans, and they are far, far better. May God grant you the optimism. May God grant you the confidence to know that this very life that you have, this is the very life that God will bless extraordinarily. Also, as you can see, God has hundreds of options in reserve to fulfill his extraordinary goodness in our life. You might be looking at one or two options that have failed in your life. You might be thinking, that's it. What are the other options that I have? It is true, we don't have many options. It is true that on many occasions, we might try all our options and they might come to nothing. Everything might just come crashing down. Everything might be futile. But if you place your hope in God, if you place your faith in God, remember God's extraordinary goodness can come to you at a time when you least expect it. Why? Because it is due to God's favor, God's unmerited favor, God's grace. God has hundreds of options in reserve to fulfill his extraordinary goodness in my life. God will never run out of options and his options will never fail. In Matthew chapter 3, from verse 7 to 9, John the Baptist told the people who are coming for baptism. John the Baptist said to them, make sure you produce the fruit of repentance. Because if you don't do so, and you continue to claim that you are Abraham's children, God can raise children for, for Abraham in many other ways. God can raise children for Abraham, even from these stones. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. God has hundreds of options in reserve to fulfill his own purposes in our life. God will never run out of options, and his own options will never fail. The same thing in Luke chapter 19, verses 37 to 40. When the Pharisees were stopping the children from welcoming the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem, when the children were shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest, some of the Pharisees called to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. If these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. What does that tell me? It tells me that God has hundreds of options in reserve to fulfill his extraordinary goodness 
in my life, my own options are few. My own options can fail. But thank God, thank God, when I least expect it, God's extraordinary goodness will come to me simply by the matter of his grace. And grace means unmerited favor, favor that I have not worked for, favor that is just the essence of God's goodness, the essence of God's nature towards his own children. You see, when you look at the story of Mephibosheth, and how God just went for him and took him out of obscurity, took him out of ignominy, took him out of shame and disgrace. How God went for Mephibosheth in Lodiba and got Mephibosheth out of poverty and brought him to Jerusalem and made him favored by King David, who sat Mephibosheth around his royal table as one of his own children. When you look at it, you will see that with God, your wasted years can be more than fully restored. God restored the wasted years of Mephibosheth. All the wasted years. God restored the wasted years of Mephibosheth with something extraordinary. What is it that you think you have missed out on in life that you can say, if I were in a better country, if I were in the UK, if I were in the US, if I were in South Africa, if I were in Dubai, you know, my life would be different. I would make it in life. Listen, God knows where you are. What he did for Mephibosheth, at a time that Mephibosheth least expected it, God is more than willing to do for you too. And by doing it, God will restore all your wasted years. Years when you could have built a house. Years when you could have married. Years when you could have had children. Years when you could have had a fantastic business. Years when you could have become somebody. Remember Mephibosheth. God found him. Mephibosheth was not even looking for God. He had given up. He had lost hope. But God went and found Mephibosheth. And God restored his wasted years with something extraordinary. This is what we find in Joel, the book of Joel, or Joel, chapter 2, verses 25 to 26. God says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. So whatever has happened to you, there are only two reasons. One, it has been caused directly by God, or it has just been permitted by God. The sovereignty of God is always at work in the life of his children. The sovereignty of God is always at work, even in the world at large, how much more in the life of us, his children. This one life that you have, with all its shortcomings, with all its failures, remember what the Lord is saying to us today. God knows all about it. Everything that you have experienced, the good, the bad, and the ugly, God knows about it. Why? Because it is either God caused it directly or God permitted it to happen anyway. And this is the same life that God will transform. This is the same life that God will bless with something extraordinary. That's what the Lord was saying to the people of Israel in the book of Joel, chapter 2, from verse 25 to 26. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. 
my great army which I sent among you. See what will happen now. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Look at Mephibosheth. From shame to fame, from zero to hero, from nothing to something, from being a nobody to becoming a somebody, all because God's favor found him at a time that he least expected. May God do the same for you in the name of Jesus. May you never be put to shame as you trust in God, as you hope in God, as you believe fervently that God will do something extraordinary with your life. Amen. Let's go to the third passage, which is Second Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 to 13. Second Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 to 13. In this passage, we see that God's extraordinary goodness can happen in our life at a time and in a measure we really do not expect when we repent of our sin. This was the case with Manasseh, a very terrible king in Jerusalem. Let's read it together again in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 to 13. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Manasseh rebuilt the high places, which Ezekiah his father had broken down. Manasseh raised up altars for the Baals, the idols. Manasseh made wooden images, wooden idols. Manasseh worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Manasseh even built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. Manasseh built altars for idols. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Manasseh also caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Enom. He killed his own sons. He practiced soothsaying. He used witchcraft. He used sorcery. He consulted mediums and spiritists. Manasseh did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke God to anger. He even set a carved image the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers. But only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them, according to the old law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks. They burned him with bronze fetters, and they carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he begged and implored the Lord his God. He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to God, and God received his entreaty. God heard his supplication 
and God brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Amen. If you are like me, you know we have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says, if we claim to have no sin, we are liars. When we are born again, thank God, we become children of God by the Holy Spirit of God in us. We are a new creation. How? Because our whole heart is now set on pleasing God. It's not about the Ten Commandments. It's not about the two commandments that the Lord Jesus tells us that these two commandments represent everything that we could ever want to do to please God. What are the two commandments? Number one, to love God exclusively. To love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our spirit, all our energy. To make God number one in everything that we do. To prioritize God in our thinking, to prioritize God in our everyday action, in what we say. The second commandment is to love others like ourselves, to love them selflessly. So when we are born again, supernaturally, we will discover that we want to love God exclusively and we want to love people selflessly. And guess what? From the very first day, we will be producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But you see, that doesn't make us perfect, perfect. We are still human beings. Whether we like it or not, we will still exhibit some shortcomings. We will still fall short, even when we don't do it deliberately. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit speak to your heart today. If you are not yet born again, I'm inviting you, please give your life to Christ Jesus. Ask Jesus to come into your life. Confess your sins to God. Tell God you are a sinner. Repent sincerely that you have offended God. But thank God that Christ Jesus stands in your place and has received your punishment. And because of his blood, you can plead and ask God to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and make you a child of God through Christ Jesus. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit touch you if you are yet to be born again. May the Holy Spirit touch you. Because you see, it's not about going to church. It's not about being the general overseer or being a pastor or being a minister. No. No. It's about being born again. And when you are born again, you will know it because God's Holy Spirit will be dwelling in your heart. You will know that you have got the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. So you see, when in the event of life you fall short in any way, remember Mephibosheth. Remember Manasseh, rather. Remember Manasseh. He did so much evil in the sight of God. But when he sincerely repented, he wasn't expecting God to restore him to his kingdom. He was just expecting God to forgive him. But God did something extraordinary. God restored him to his position as king. The king of Babylon told Manasseh, I'm re releasing you. Go back and be the king of your country again. That was unheard of. That was a fantastic miracle. When God forgives, then he blesses extraordinarily. Now, what's important is that we are not confessing our sin simply because we want to become rich. 
you want to get married, you want to buy a house, you are saying, hmm, if I confess my sin today, guess what? I will get so many good things from God. That is not the reason why we confess our sin. That is not the reason why we ask God through Christ Jesus to forgive us all our sins. Why do we confess our sin to God? Because indeed, it is very, very evil to sin against God. He is our creator and he is our redeemer in Christ Jesus. That should make us to know that we've done something evil. God is good. The very fact that God is good should make us to go back and say, Lord, I am sorry I have behaved abominably towards you. I have fallen short of your, of your glory. Please forgive me. I'm not coming back so that you can make me the president of my country, make me the best businessman or businesswoman. I'm coming back because you deserve to be worshipped and served by your, by your creatures, by the people that you created, the people that you allowed your son to die for. You deserve to be worshipped, oh God. I should worship you. I should obey you. The other reason is, when we do so, it's about being restored in our relationship to God, a relationship that leads us to heaven. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit give you the right motivation for repentance. Because you will see in the Bible that some people repented, but they only repented falsely. Remember the first king of Israel, Saul, when he disobeyed God, and then he said, I'm sorry about what I have done. But when he said he was sorry, all he wanted was to be restored to his kingdom. All he wanted was the benefits of his kingdom to be given to him. That's all he wanted. He wasn't really sorrowful for causing such a great, a great, great evil in the sight of God. It was, what could I get from it? He was talk, thinking more about practical benefits. He was thinking more about his belly. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit save us from that kind of repentance, calculated repentance. Another person in the Bible who did calculated repentance is Ahab, King Ahab. He went back and said, forgive me, O God. He fasted, he wept, and God forgave him. But it was not from a genuine heart that he repented. As you know, Ahab even became worse as soon as God forgave him and restored him to glory. Ahab became worse in his attitude towards God, in his attitude towards every other person that he could cheat, exploit, kill. So God doesn't want us to do false repentance, fake repentance. God wants us to do genuine repentance. When we genuinely repent, we will produce the fruit of repentance. We will become obedient will become loving towards God and will become selflessly loving towards others. Amen. That's the kind of repentance that we see in Luke chapter 15 when we look at the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son went away, spent everything that his father had given him, wasted it completely. And when he came back to his senses, he said, I will return to my father. I will say to my father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven. I do not deserve to be called your son. Please make me one of your servants. That is genuine repentance. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven. I am not fit to be called your son again. Please make me one of your servants. 
And in that parable, in Luke chapter 15, the Lord Jesus tells us that the Father was so joyful, he wrapped himself around the Son. He said, this my Son was dead, now he's alive. He was lost, now he is found. And the Lord Jesus says, there is much more joy in heaven over one sinner who genuinely repents. How would you know that you have repented? When you begin to produce the fruit of repentance, when you now submit to the Lordship of God in Christ Jesus, when you are now faithful in your obedience to God, Amen. Amen. So you see, when we genuinely repent, God can do something incredible to restore us to our position in his love. When we genuinely repent, God can do something incredible to restore us to our position in his love. Guess what? The extraordinary goodness of God will pour into our life because of his grace, we will obtain a merited favor. At a time when we least expect it, God will bless us extraordinarily. Amen. Amen. We have to finish. Let's look at the fourth passage, which is in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Here we see that the goodness of God can find us and overtake us at a time we least expect it. Let's try and read it together. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when Jesus stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And this man wore no clothes, this man did not live in a house, but he was living in the tombs. When this man saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before Jesus. And with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For the unclean spirit often sees the man. Therefore he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And the man with this unclean spirit broke the bonds and was driven by the demon, by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked the demon, saying, What is your name? And the demon replied, Legion, because many demons had entered this man. And the demons begged Jesus that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So the demons begged Jesus that he would permit them to enter the swine, to enter the pigs. And Jesus permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who were feeding the pigs saw what had happened, they ran away and they told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and many people came to Jesus. Then they found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And everybody that came and saw him were afraid. They were afraid. They also they also, who had seen it, told every other person, saying, by what means the demon-possessed person had been healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the gatherings asked Jesus to depart from them, for all of them were seized with great fear. So Jesus got into the boat and returned. But the man from, the, from whom the demons had departed begged Jesus, that he might be with Jesus. For Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. 
Return to your own house. Go and tell people what great things God has done for you at a time when you least expect it. How you have received unmerited favor. And the man went his way. And he began to proclaim throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Amen. The man had had demons, demons for a long, long time. How long a problem has been is nothing consequential when the time comes for God to deal with it in our life. I know what I'm talking about. Problems can be there for a month, a week, a year, years. But you keep serving God. You keep trusting God. You keep praying to God. You keep believing in God. How long a problem has been there in our life has no consequence when God comes and visits us with his extraordinary goodness. The man had had demons for a long time. He wore no clothes. He did not live in a house. He was living in the tombs. Even when the man saw Jesus, the man did not ask for deliverance. No, he only cried out, fell down before Jesus, and said with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus? Do not torment me. What he does not know, what this man does not know, is that actually Jesus came that way to show him God's unmerited favor. Jesus comes my way at a time when I do not even expect it to show me God's unmerited favor. At a time that this man who was afflicted with demons did not expect. At a time even when this man who was afflicted with demons could not call for help. That was the time that Jesus showed up and delivered the man from a terrible condition. Do you get what the Lord is teaching us today? God's extraordinary goodness, when we least expect it, it's only because of his grace, only because of a merited favor. The story of this man shows us that no situation is too bad that God cannot turn it around. No situation is too bad that God cannot turn it around. Believe God for the extraordinary. When God will do it, it will be at a time when you least expect it. Don't give up. There is no situation that is too difficult that God cannot overcome. A man who had demons. A man who was going about naked. A man who was living in tombs. The day God stepped into his life, Everything changed overnight. God's extraordinary goodness will find you overnight and change your story. The man from whom ladies were running away, now ladies were saying to him, we would like to marry you. The man whom nobody wanted to see, nobody wanted to listen to, became a celebrity overnight. Why? Because God's extraordinary goodness found him when he least expected it. When God's grace comes into your life, in any situation that you are expecting God, it changes your life overnight in a moment. I'm grateful to God that I can genuinely tell you, this is what has blessed me day in, day out in my life. God's grace the unmerited favor of God. Another thing that we can see in this story is that our adversity actually has limits. You may be thinking your adversity has been going on for a long, long time, maybe for months, maybe for years. You may be thinking that the situation that you face, that maybe some people are asking, where is your God? Maybe in your family, maybe at work, maybe in your neighborhood, 
your situation is so well known. Everybody knows the stigma that you carry. Everybody knows the shame that you carry. I really want to reassure you in today's broadcast, our adversity has limits. Even though sometimes we feel as if our adversity is bottomless, it has no limit. Our adversity has limits. It won't go beyond the day. It won't go beyond the hour. It won't go beyond the second that God steps in and restores us to his grace, his unmerited favor. Our adversity has limits, but God's goodness is bottomless. The goodness of God is bottomless. That's why when God steps into your life, overnight everything changes rapidly, unrecognizably. The compensation is awesome. This transformation is, so, is awesome. And it's always at a time when you least expect it. Amen. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, Paul the Apostle says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. God allows us to be struck down, but we are not destroyed. What an awesome father. If you are still alive, guess what? God still has something extraordinary to do in your life. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. God is determined to show us his goodness. God is determined. God is resolved to show us his goodness. God's goodness is not an afterthought. It's not that God thinks, mm, what can I do for Kemi today? Mm, I'm thinking, mm, no. No, it's not an afterthought. God's goodness is not accidental. Is well planned, well ordained. God's goodness is the essence of his nature. God's goodness is intentional towards me. God's goodness is constantly pursuing me. You may not think about it that way, but believe me sincerely, God's goodness is constantly pursuing his children. God is the best father any one of us can have. No matter what we are going through in life, the goodness of God is not limited. The goodness of God is not affected by what affects us. When you least expect it, God's goodness will overtake you. Why? Because of his grace. The unmerited favor of God will overtake you. God's goodness is intentional. God's goodness is constantly pursuing us. Amen. When you constantly believe God for the extraordinary, I want to reassure you, you will receive God's favor when you least expect it. Let me say it to you again. When you constantly believe God for the extraordinary, you will receive God's favor when you least expect it. Never give up on God, especially when life is most difficult for you. Never ever give up on God, especially when life is very difficult for you. Because at such times, it's easy for people to give up on God. But you never do it. When you constantly believe God for the extraordinary, you will receive God's favor when you least expect it. I have been through a lot in life already. By the grace of God, I am 64 years old. So I can tell you, I've been through a lot in life already. But my experience has taught me that God's goodness will come through for me, especially when I least expect it. That's what my experience has taught me. 
Remember what the psalmist says. He says, I've been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging for bread. My experience has taught me that God's goodness will come through for me, especially when I least expect it. So I want to say to you, always remind yourself that your life is in God's hands. Always remind yourself, no matter how challenging life is, always remind yourself that your life is in the hands of God. In the midst of his troubles, when everything seems lost and hopeless, David says in Psalm 31, verses 14 to 15, David says, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. I always remind myself in good times, in bad times, that my life is in the hands of God. As for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. Psalm 31, verses 14 to 15. My experience has taught me that God is always working in my life. Whether it rains or shines, in good times, even in evil days, even when the enemy seems to have won, even when tears are falling pretty quickly from my eyes, listen carefully. I really want you to know, I always remind myself that God is working in my life. And therefore, I have learned to trust him. You too, you need to learn to trust God. Everything that you are going through is to help you to learn to put your full trust in God. Every situation in my life, the good, the bad, the ugly, I have used it to trust in God. When I am joyful, I am trusting in God. When I am sorrowful, I am trusting in God. God is always working in your life. Use every opportunity, every situation to trust God. God has a plan and God is working behind the scenes. He is the one who takes what the enemy intended for harm and destruction and turns it around for good. You see this in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph told his brothers, what you did, you meant it for evil, but God turns it around for good. God is always working in the background. People who love us, people who hate us, it doesn't matter. That's why I say, you throw me up, you dash me down, you do whatever you want to do. God will use it for good in my life. Amen. God has a plan. In all that the enemy does against me, God has a good plan for me. God is walking behind the scenes. He is the one who will take what the enemy intends for evil. And he will turn it around for good. So don't ever give up when life is difficult and hopeless. I'm encouraging someone, I'm encouraging myself to, please don't ever give up when life is difficult and hopeless. Giving up on God is giving up on the true essence of life. God is your life. Houses, cars, children, marriage, every other thing can come and go. But God is the essence of your life. So don't give up on God. That's what the Holy Spirit has taught me. Never to give up on God, no matter what is happening. Why? God is actually the essence of my life. God said to Abraham, God says, Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your essence. 
I'm the essence of your life. And that's why all things will eventually work together for your good. If you don't give up, you'll soon have a you soon have a testimony. Your test will become a testimony. Your failure will become a success. Your adversity will turn into prosperity. If you don't give up, very soon, other people will be looking at you and saying, see what God has done with our life. See what God has done with his life. And that's because you never gave up. And God's goodness came at a time when you least expected it. God's grace, God's unmerited favor will find you if you don't give up. God has already provided the solution to your problems. God has already provided the solution to your problems. They will manifest. The solutions that God has provided will eventually manifest in your life. They will become a reality. Today it looks like when will they become a reality? But every day, every minute, you are getting closer to the reality of what God has already done in your life. Remember today's broadcast, the extraordinary goodness of God, when we least expect it. The extraordinary goodness of God, when we least expect it. Never give up because God is with you. God has called you by your name. Just make sure every day you are in relationship with God. You are close to God. Don't let anything destroy your relationship with God. Don't let anything diminish your relationship with God. Stand firm. Stand firm. When you least expect it, God will come true for you. In Christ Jesus, God loves us in the midst of our trouble. In the very midst of our trouble, God still loves us. In Christ Jesus, God accepts us in the midst of our trouble. He accepts us. He reaches out towards us. When we sin and genuinely repent, God forgives us in Christ Jesus in the midst of our trouble. Even right now, in Christ Jesus, God stretches his hands towards us to help us in the midst of our trouble. God is my ever-present help in the time of trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. Nahum chapter 1, verse 7 says, God is good. He knows those who trust in him. He is our ever-present help in the time of trouble. God helps, helps us. He stretches out his hand towards us in the midst of our trouble. The grace of God is never put off by our mistakes. The grace of God is never put off by our mistakes. In Psalm 30, the Lord says to us, listen, when God is angry, is but for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. When God is unhappy with us because we have sinned, it is but for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. So don't give up on God. The grace of God is never put off by our mistakes. The grace of God is never offended by our shortcomings. In fact, grace does its best work when we are hopeless and helpless. If you can turn towards God daily, every moment of your life, you will discover that grace does its best work when you are hopeless and helpless. That's my experience. The unmerited favor of God finds me when I am hopeless and helpless. Why? Because grace is the unmerited favor of God. I have to finish. Time is far gone. You must believe God for the extraordinary. 
because God's extraordinary goodness is pursuing you and will overtake you when least expected. Amen. I'll say it again as we finish. You must believe God for the extraordinary because God's extraordinary goodness is pursuing you and will overtake you when least expected. Amen. This is where we will stop. I thank God for all that God has taught us in this series on believing God for the extraordinary. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit come through for you as you wait upon him, as you trust in him, as you pray to him, as you believe him for something extraordinary. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit touch you. May your faith arise. May you know that what the eye has not seen, what the ear has not heard, that is what God has reserved for those whom he loves and those who love him. May God do something extraordinary with your life. I remain your host, Pastor Dr. Emmy Atunda Hillary, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. But we will start another series shortly. I want to say thank you for watching this broadcast. Thank you for listening to this broadcast. May God bless you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye.